say something about them. <laughs> so I, I visibly sat there and uh, uh, Frankenstein stitched together several slides from old talks to make some something to you know my comments on what Peter was saying. Um, I I feel like. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working. I'm working on. I had some, some idea after talking about this matrix stuff yesterday, and so then I didn't want to explain uh, coding design in the way that I was going to, which was using this a, a kind of ancient uh, technique that I've that I learned when I was in school, and I've I've been using ever since. And I thought uh, I thought maybe I have a better way to design codings, but I then I didn't finish it yet. I'll wait until tomorrow. So today, I just I'll I'll comment about this uh, coding thermal noise a little bit, uh, what what Peter was getting at, and then uh, and then move on to the sort of more general optics stuff that I think would be useful uh, to do before this afternoon when we try out try out finesse. Something's happening. Thermal noise. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I think, I, I just want to preface by saying I'm not really a thermal noise expert. I think I've written maybe one paper and done a few experiments about this, but I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this topic that, and I'm not so confident I've just done some reading, but this is sort of how I feel and my guesses uh, about thermal noise. The, the reason we keep talking about this uh, coding thermal noise is because, maybe I have a slide that talks about it. Yes. Uh, this is the advanced LIGO performance. And it's limited in this acoustic band by this coding thermal noise, which it's a little bit mysterious. And I think until, maybe until Peter's group started looking into this in the 90s, the, the belief was that the thermodynamic limit to the to the uh, detection would be the mirror thermal noise, which makes sense. We have a mirror. It's gigantic. And then on top of that, we have something which is uh, some some sort of few few microns of, uh, of some dielectric thin film. And why should it be that we even talk about this thing? Surely, if you have uh, what, what Peter was just saying and some Brownian action going on and thermoelastic fluctuations, this, this 10, 10, 30, 40, 100, whatever, many kilograms thing should, can, should be moving quite a lot. And the contribution from this thin thing is almost nothing. And uh, if, you, if you asked yourself, I have an isotropic cube and I squeeze it, um, how do I know how much dissipation is going on? It has to do with how the strain is distributed in the system, and it has to do with the Q of the system. But if it's isotropic and I squeeze it, and there's kind of a uniform strain over the thing, then, then the stored energy within the thing, within all of the different volume elements, would be the same. And as long as the loss is isotropic, then, then it's also the same. And then if you, sa if you said how much, would I, how much loss, di how much dissipation, and therefore how much fluctuation comes from the front surface, the answer is vanishingly small. It, and the ratio of microns to, to several centimeters, there's no contest. Not, none of it would come from the surface. So it's a little bit, I, I think, non-intuitive that we get this. Why does this uh, thin surface layer matter so much? And so I wanted to talk about it a little. Uh, yes. OK. So just to describe a little bit how these things work, um, uh, I think as Ollie was showing, there's these different things, uh, E-beam sputtered coatings, uh, ion assisted deposition, and then finally what's sort of the st state of the art, and then of the, the many subspecies of state of the art, but uh, ion beam sputtered coatings. Um, these basically came from the military, and uh, oft I think sometimes we don't like to acknowledge this because, you know, academics are pacifists and don't like to acknowledge that there's some scientific goodness which comes from war, but apparently there is. So, because people wanted to build this. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, we wanted to do uh, we not 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 me. I was I was. I'm not to blame for any of this. Somebody wanted to build missiles and have inertial guidance, and so they said the way to do it is to do 
these uh, small ring laser gyros, which can measure uh, rotation accurately over the time it takes a missile to travel across the world. And this has had some sort of resurgence lately because people are afraid that uh, uh, someone may turn off the GPS satellites in times of war, so you need to have your own uh, inertial guidance. You need to have your own rotation sensing and inertial guidance. So uh, I think a lot of people are, are still looking into this. But uh, the problem with these things was there was too much loss. You couldn't get high finesse. And there's a classic problem in ring laser gyro gyros called the lock-in problem, which is if you're not shaking them all the time, they lock in. And there's a dead band where at low rotation amplitudes you can't measure anything. And it has to do uh, partly with the fact that the mirrors scattered too much and, and propagate light into the counter-rotating mode. Anyway, there's a whole, it's a whole uh, old, old story. No. Uh, so people developed uh, better coatings. And... Um, Litton was one of the companies that really led this, and a lot of other people have done it now. And so you have these uh, very fancy chambers where people do all kinds of chemistry, science, slash alchemy, a mi mixed bag of art and science in order to make very nice coatings. And they look something like this, they look like uh, thin film things. Uh, and this is the diagram of what goes on inside of them. Here's a substrate of made of glass. And then on top of that, you put some higher index material, whether it has an index of refraction between 2 and 3 or so. And then you can put some low index, high index, and so on. And there's a wells, uh, this is a well-known property that if you make them have a quarter wave in terms of the optical path length, then you can get a very high reflectivity uh, uh, stack. And so we, we would like to get reflectivities where we have something like uh, several nines, so the transmission should be less than 10 ppm. And in order to, that, to do that, you have to have something like 40, 50, 60 layers. It depends on some details and some secrets, which I'm not allowed to divulge, proprietary company secrets, but people have uh, secret mixes of exactly what kind of dopants and annealing profiles and things that go into making these things have low absorption, low mechanical loss, and Anyway, they put it together, there's some alternating stack. So, so now what happens? Why is this such a problem? You can do it, you can, you know, like th this is a design I, I made just in MATLAB and uh, with some, uh, yeah, just with a quarter wave system you can get this 10 ppm transmission. Um, but it still doesn't explain why it's a problem thermal noise wise. Um, so th there's this nice description um, by uh, Yuri Levin who who adopted the technique that Peter and uh, Gabby Gonzalez came up with for analyzing the noise of uh, mirror suspensions and applied it to, to optics. And the, the, the concept of how you, how you calculate the expected fluctuation for mirror suspensions is that you, you make a model of the suspension, you say, here it is. And if you could do it, you would do it with a finite element model. And you say, in my finite element model, I apply some, some force and I move the suspension in the way that uh, giving it the motion that I'm interested in, interested in measuring. And you can put in at each frequency uh, that kind of motion and measure per cycle how much energy is dissipated. And that's the dissipation. And that, conversely, that, also, that tells you about the uh, admittance and the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And it also tells, and then, it, and then you can use that to calculate the fluctuation you get. And, uh, I guess, so when I describe it like that, you, maybe it, you might wonder why it's so obvious. Why is that even worth talking about? It's because there were many other techniques for doing it which were more, turned out to be more difficult, which uh, you don't want to hear about that. Anyway, so that, that's a technique for suspensions. And then uh, the, uh, le the Levin technique here is to say uh, how, how to apply that to mirrors. And so you can do the same thing and say, uh, what I'm interested in is the phase shift that a Gaussian beam will measure when bouncing off an optic surface. And at the time he was working on this, I think this was really a, just of interest in this uh, gravity wave community. And it turned out to be that this coding thermal noise is now a limit to all kinds of experiments in uh, optomechanics and uh, atomic clocks, precision frequency standards, and so on. So it's, it's worth exploring. Um, so anyway, you, you, you say, I, I care about the phase shift that this Gaussian beam will feel after it bounces off the surface. And the, 
the conjugate the, the, the conjugate uh, degree of freedom uh, that you uh, drive in order to measure the phase shift of this Gaussian beam is a Gaussian pressure distribution. So you push on this substrate plus coating with the Gaussian pressure and you measure the dissipation that you get. And as it turns out, the, you know, one of the, in fact, the dominant term in uh, figuring out the fluctuation that you get comes from the energy stored and the, and the dissipation in this tiny, tiny surface layer. And yes, there, there is deformation throughout the bulk here, but if you look uh, at this ratio of the actual cues you get in these materials, th there's no contest. There's basically, you know, to, to a good approximation, there is no energy dissipated by straining the substrate. Just because people have worked so long to make the cue of these materials so good, there's almost no dissipation. And a lot of dissipation happens on the front surface. Uh, another, uh, another way to get intu intuition about it, I, I think, is to, is to imagine uh, your beam is here and bouncing off the surface. And what does it really matter if there's some fluctuations going down and down here? If, if I apply some thermal force here deep into the bulk, it won't really make it to the, to the surface. But here, this coating is right on the surface. And any fluctuation that you get in the strain of the coating will, will directly give you a phase shift on the beam. And of course, there's some averaging going on. So the, definitely, the bigger you make your beam, the more you can average out these thermal fluctuations. So that helps you. That's one way to... Uh, reduce the noise, but it still remains that that this is a big problem, and basically, it's just because the Q is so so low. But I just told you that um, some of these materials are are just they're you know silica. Th this one here happens to be uh, a kind of tantalum oxide, but some of these layers are just uh, uh, you know silicon dioxide. It's it's ostensibly the same as the substrate, and and why is the Q so low? factor of 10,000. It's not just factors of a few or something. It's really anomalous. You can put down a ion beam sputtered glass coating on a piece of glass and the Q will be different by a factor of 10 to the 4. That's, that's mystery. Uh, I th or so I thought. Um, and then, uh, you know, I went to the library and did some reading, as you do when you don't know what's going on. Um, there's this guy, Paul, at uh, Cornell University, and uh, completely outside of the field, he's been measuring uh, dissipation in amorphous thin films for some decades, or, or he has been. Who knows why? So it's, some, it's of some interest. And there's even a model for it dating back to the uh, late 80s, actually, I think even early 80s. And the model is that um, in all of these thin films, there's many, many, many uh, two-level systems within the system. And these two-level systems correspond to uh, uh, absorption peaks up at very high frequency, something like tens, hundreds of megahertz. And what we see when we do uh, measurements in the acoustic band, which is effectively DC, is we see the tail of these very high frequency resonances. And so we're, ex we're exciting. The two-level system, you, you may think about it as uh, you have this whole, whole uh, long uh, bunch of silica, and uh, it can be arranged like this, or it can be arranged in a slightly different configuration. And these low energy sort of milli EV excitations allow it to reconfigure itself from this configuration into this other one. And uh, this, this theory that I'm pointing out here, this is it's sort of a phenomenological theory, but uh, they use it, it seems to have a remarkably good predictive power, and so, Although it's not a true microphysical theory, it's, it's, it's the one people seem to use. So anyway, everything is bad. All amorphous thin films are bad. Um, si few silica is, as Peter was saying, it was pretty anomalous. When you get it to several hundred degrees, even the thin film seems to have a very high Q. Yeah, another mystery. Um, anyway, we're not uh, here to solve these mysteries. We're just noting that they're there. Uh, so one, one possibility to get away from this is to go to uh, something which does not have such low energy excitations, which, which is to use crystalline mirror coatings. And I'm not going to go further through this, but it, as it turns out, since the early 80s, people have been using uh, these techniques in making lasers, these vertical cavity something something pixels. Um, but they've been, develop, they've been, they've been developing uh, 
techniques to make really solid, really uniform uh, uh, crystalline coatings of all kinds of different uh, stoichiometry. So Allagas happens to be one of the most uh, well-developed ones, and there have now been some uh, demonstrations of good uh, low coating thermal noise using gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide uh, coatings. And one of, the, one of the issues there is that the thing has to be grown and then lifted off and reattached to your, your mirror, and so there, there could be problems there. So we're also exploring the idea of uh, directly gl growing these onto some sort of crystalline mirror substrate. So it's possible, you have to have some lattice matching, so maybe uh, you can use gallium phosphide or gallium antimony or gallium something, gallium blah, 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 anything in that column. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, and then I don't have slides for it, but an, another possibility uh, where we, we don't really have a good idea, it's waiting for somebody sharp to come up with something, is the possibility of using uh, total internal reflection as a way to do, uh, as a way to make a mirror. And there have been some proposals for it by uh, Braginsky and <coughs> folks at uh, ANU in Australia, but it's, uh, we, we don't yet have a, something where all of the technical issues are solved. It, but it seems like uh, even for the crystal coatings, the Q is not as good as the actual substrate. It's 10 times or 50 times better than the amorphous thin films, but it's not gonna, it won't give us something like factor of 100 in sensitivity. But if there's some interesting geometry you can come up with which will allow for uh, total internal reflection optics, it can be a huge uh, advance not just in this field, but in uh, all kinds of tabletop precision measurements and frequency standards. So, so it's a challenge. Um, okay, so that's that's all I have about thermal noise. Uh, now I wanted to just say some things about. Oh, lost my notes. Uh, about optics. So there's these, so I, I'll, I'll say some things about this ABD, ABCD approach because uh, it's kind of elementary but we use it quite a lot for doing uh, uh, mode matching of lasers to cavities and so I think it's an interesting uh, technique to know about. When I tell it to you, you'll, you'll sort of say it's simple and what's the point and I, really I'm just saying here's a recipe for using it and you don't have to read several hundred pages and go down a lot bunch of blind alleys. Uh, so wh what is it? Um, here I've drawn some matrices for you and I'm just going to draw a cartoon for you which will illuminate the whole thing. Yeah, so the, the picture is the following. We're just, at first, just doing ray tracing. So we start off, there's a ray which has a distance from the optic axis of x0, and it has an angle with respect to the optical axis of theta0. And then what I'm saying is, let's do a matrix operation, and we'll be able to find its, its final uh, parameters, what its distance from the optic axis and its angle. And um, these are some formulas for some components, but let's let's see how they how we get those. Uh, so let's let's look at this first one. Um, when we say we start off with something at this angle, and I say I want to find out after it propagates for a distance d, what what will it have? Well, it propagates for a distance d. Uh, the angle won't change; it's still going at the same angle, but it's its uh, position from the axis will change by a factor theta times d, which is just, just geometry. So I say if, if I want to represent it as a two by two matrix, how should I get it? 
Well, I say this is x and theta. I have some elements to fill in x0, theta0, zero, theta0. Zero. So I said the angle won't change, so I want that uh, this should just have a 0 and a 1. So theta, zero, theta equals to theta0. And then I said x should be equal to x0 plus theta0 times d. So, so that's what we got. Anyway, so you can use the same kind of logic, uh, use your uh, basic optics for how uh, uh, how lenses act, and you can you can write down this kind of matrix for uh, transmission through a thin lens, reflection from a curved mirror. You can also do it through interfaces, ducts, thick lenses, and as long as you can uh, build up your optical system by some combination of these things, you can always use this technique for simple ray tracing. So this is for this is for ray tracing, but uh, so far that this doesn't do the trick for us for uh, how to match the real uh, Gaussian shaped beams or even higher order mode beams from laser into some sort of resonator or uh, between systems or manipulating it. But as it as it turns out, the the ray tracing technique also just works for Gaussian beams. Um, so what's a what's Gaussian beams? Uh, We've been talking about it all week, but I just wanted to be explicit and describe it. This is uh, if you look if you look around, there's some different normalization conventions here and there. Um, this this is the uh, which one is this? This is the one which assumes that basically u you know magnitude of u squared will be equal to one. So it's usual uh, normalization, and this is integrated over all space. So there's a few few terms in this formula. Uh, what is u? So here u is a function. Yeah. So if you, if you, it's really just a function. But if you if you put something in front of it like e to to mean the amplitude of your electric field, then yeah, it's the, it's, it's the electric field. Uh, but yeah, yeah, electric field. Um, and so it has a few uh, functions. And most of them you can see here in this diagram. I have a beam. It has a Gaussian spatial distribution. It propagates. These are its, uh, the curvature of its wavefront as it propagates. And here are all the various formulas which tell you about it. I think most of them are intuitive. You have a Gaussian beam. It travels for a while. It's Gaussian. Uh, it has some width. Uh, this uh, W0 is called the waste, which is which uh, corresponds to the radius of the beam at which it has um, 1 over e squared of its uh, maximum value. Um, this w without the 0, usually people refer to as the spot size. It's always the radius, though. And when you say, diam you know, when you mean diameter, it should say diameter and not waist. Um, there's a couple of in intrinsic parameters. There's uh, this thing called the Rayleigh range. Um, I don't know what Rayleigh had to do with it, but we, anyway, we say Rayleigh range, and this tell this is sort of to give you a feel for which which distance at which uh, the beam will have expanded by a certain amount, and in particular, it's the distance at which the beam will have increased by a factor of root two. And so you say, well, uh, the Rayleigh range of my beam is 10 meters. It means you, basically you can propagate it for 10 meters be before you have to worry about it spreading. That's a thing to keep in mind. Uh, one uh, maybe one of the mysterious, seemingly mysterious properties of Gaussian beams is the so-called uh, uh, GUI phase, and this is mispronounced and misspelled often. Um, well, I learned it as the GOI phase for some reason. I think GOI means something else, but uh, as the French pronounce, I think the French pronounce it as GUI. We should we should follow what they what they say. Uh, this has to do with an extra phase shift that the beam picks up because it's not a plane wave. And I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more in a bit. Anyway, we have, we have this electric field distribution, uh, and it's propagating. And now we'd like to see how does it transform when we use t uh, typical elements like mirrors and lenses. Um, and so for doing that, we introduce this uh, complex beam parameter. And I feel like this is also 
mysterious in the way that it's often described. Um, they just say, here is this parameter and go on and use it. If you, if you look at it though, I think it has a, a nice physical meaning. Um, we use it as a complex number because it's handy mathematically, but it, it's sort of like a complex uh, radius of curvature for the beam. And uh, why, does it, why does it transform in the same way that, uh, why, why can we use ray matrix tools for it? And I think that's interesting. So you look back here and you say, uh, here I've constructed these two by two matrices for how to transform the distance from the axis and the angle of the beam as it propagates. And now I'm, I'm telling you here that um, somehow we can apply the same transformation uh, to this complex uh, beam parameter and also transform the Gaussian beam in that way. Doesn't it, it seems a little too fortuitous, right? How could it be that the same matrices apply to ray, same matrices help you with ray tracing and Gaussian beam propagation? Well, let's, let's do it a little bit and then maybe you'll feel that, at, at the end of it, you'll feel that it was, it was fortuitous. So a, a problem might be something like this. I have a laser and uh, inside of here, this box, there is, let's say, there's a waste. And so I say I have here a parameter W0 equals something. And then the beam escapes from here. And then I have a resonator over here, um, some cavity. And I'd like to make this beam uh, go into here. And in here, I've got uh, this thing two times W cavity. So how to, how to make this go into here? Um, well, I said, said here that the, the parameters of the beam are entirely specified by this Q parameter. Uh, and we can define, well, we can define Z how we'd like. So we can say, let's say this this point is z equals to zero, and we can say this this distance to here we can call it z prime. And so now, any ideas? What should we do? E even ignoring this this math, what based on this cartoon, what do you think should be done? Lens, yes. So let's say we put a lens in the middle someplace. So maybe the beam does this, and if we choose the lens appropriately, maybe it happens to match into here. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so what can we, how should we uh, represent this propagation though? We have, we have this, we have this distance, we have this distance and one lens, right? And we have from the, from here we know how to represent these as matrices, right? There's a lens matrix and there's distance matrix. So let's say we call this one D1, and this one F1, and this one will be D2. OK. But now what? Yeah, yeah. So let's say we have, so this initial vector we have uh, Q. So we'd like to say, what if we transform through this space and get to this lens, what are we going to have? Let's call this Q, uh, Q1. Q1 and Q1 and 1 is going to be equal to 1, D1, and Q0, 1, like this, right? Yes? 
Yes. Yes, that's the truth. But you you skipped ahead to my answer. You you've ruined the uh, missed the climate the suspense. Yeah. yeah. So okay, wh why do we have to write them in reverse order? I mean, here I would intuitively I would say it's okay to write it like this. I I take this, I do this matrix transform, and I get this new value here. And then to this new one, I would apply this transformation matrix, right? Seems like it makes sense. You're saying that it's, it's not correct to do, uh, it, to write the final thing, I would have thought this, right? That you would say Q, uh, final, and then I would just stick the matrices together and have... Are you saying this is not okay or we should reverse? This is okay? Yeah. So then, but then, so then, I mean, it, it causally it seems to work, I guess. You can, tr you can transform one step at a time. But you're, you're just saying that this is backwards. Instead, instead of writing it this one, then this one, and this one, you just do it this way. So it, then, I mean, at first, and you, when you write it down, if you just say you have to write them backwards, you may say, well, why do we have to do that? But if you just look at how you step through the system, it kind of makes sense. We have to transform each thing costly. Uh, so anyway, so now you can, you can do this. You can do the matrix transform, and you get an equation. And uh, uh, you can then write down what this is. This um, it's, it's simpler often that you just do the matrix calculation ahead of time. So you can stick uh, these three matrices together, you'll get a final matrix. And then you can label them A, B, C, D. If you do that, uh, and then you look at this vector equation that I've written there, to get the final Q, you just write down this equation. And you have the A, B, and C, D elements. And it's a, a remarkably compact way to go from one, uh, one place in your optical system to the other. And for any kind of arbitrary system, as long as you can represent it with these elements, you can always get this final Q in terms of the initial Q this way. Yeah. And it is correct in the uh, second line, where we are written all the time. Ah, um, no, no, this, this is just the, the Q from this, this point. No, that, it's okay. I think so. Oh, oh. Uh, you're, yeah, it's even better. You're not even confused. That's the best kind of confusion. Yeah. Anyway, so you you do this, you get this equation, and now now what to do about it? In the in the practical case, uh, you have this co you have this complex number which is due to these, you know, you, which you get from this fraction, and what, what to do about it practically. Well, you have to keep in mind the, uh, this, you know, these D, D numbers are sort of continuously variable in a, in a real optical setup. You have, you have freedom to move things around, um, whereas this focal length is not, typically. You're, you're not you're not working with some sort of magical device that has a continuously variable focal length, uh, although uh, in the future it may be so. So uh, practically speaking, what you have to do is you, s you, have to, you have to make some initial guess and say, this is the lens I will use, and then I can move it around. And maybe some other things are constrained here. If your cavity position is fixed or the position of your laser is fixed, and these kinds of things reduce the number of degrees of freedom. Otherwise, you're working in a really wide parameter space. You can pick independent distances and lens focal length. So as, as, a, as a practical recipe, often, often what we do is we take our software program, which is going to do this matching, 
and we give it a list of all of the possible all of the lenses we have in our box or all of the lenses we we think we can buy and some initial constraints and then let it scan over this space and then uh, what you'll find I think in in many cases is that it's a kind of degenerate problem that if you have uh, you can use this lens and do this matching but for basically you know all you're trying to do is match two degrees of freedom you have two parameters in this queue and if you have three degrees of freedom it's overdetermined if you have two lenses which you can often have it's very very uh, very very degenerate there's many many choices you can make and so a thing which is still missing uh, you'll see as you as you download finesse and try to use it for some of these things there's a code that goes along with it jammmt and there's a few other codes available in the community for doing this mode matching they do they do these this kind of thing and there's GUI tools that will uh, uh, let you visualize what's going on but what's what's missing at this moment is a way to break this degeneracy if you've got uh, 50 solutions then what to do about it Is there any any thoughts? Let I me mean, let, let's imagine j just this case. Uh, you try uh, you have, let's say you have two lenses in your box, and you put it put it into this, and you move it around numerically using your favorite program, and you find that there is uh, two solutions that both lenses will work, and you you have to change the distance to someone. Speak up. You say use the longer focal length. Why? Yeah. In fact, no, not, not, not everyone can see your. I understand what you're saying, but you have to describe it's what you're saying. Less sensitive to the position. That yes. 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 Yeah. Exactly. So there will be all kinds of ridiculous solutions that you can come up with. That if you use uh, super sharp lenses, that the positioning sensitivity may be sub sub millimeter sub hundred microns or something it won't be practical or this you know it may require you to have two things is existing at one point or all kinds of practical solutions like this so what's what's missing yet is is to add a thing to these codes where you do a sensitivity analysis to find out which uh, solution is impractical so as as it says on the finesse website it's it's open source and looking for contributors so once you once you learn how you know, you do this a few times by hand, and then afterwards you just do some program. But uh, one of the things I think that will speed up the work in this this field quite a bit is to have a a code which does the basically the Monte, Monte Carlo and tells you the sensitivity sensitivity of these designs. Matching concept. Yes. Can it? Be done with any arbitrary lens or a one known solution is the pi w zero w cavity divided by lambda. That's a known solution to the problem. I, I did. Can you say again? I didn't understand. What you are described today is the mode matching of two cavities using a single lens. Yes. Can it be done with any focal length or is there only one set of solution to the problem, which is the I mean one known solution is pi w zero w cavity divided by lambda. Uh, if, if it's something like this total distance z prime is fixed, then you only have one degree of freedom, and this is not a, this is not a fixed enough. omega two omega you're fixed also. Yeah, but if, if you're free to move the laser and the lens, then if that was free. Then yeah, that would be fine. But in general, to match to do two degrees of freedom, you always have to have two adjustables, and in this there is only one unless you move the laser. So. It, Personally, I, in this in this situation, I would always just use two lenses because then you have two adjustable degrees of freedom, and practically speaking, you're not having to move the laser. These all assume ideal lenses. Yeah. <coughs> um, usually, uh, the way we try to find the uh, sort of goodness of solution is at the end of it, we do this sensitivity analysis, usually by hand. And then find out how much of the power is not overlapping with the with the beam inside of the cavity. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so using these te techniques, I think uh, using this algorithm, you can often guess, you know, to within better than ninety-five percent matching, as long as you start off with a 
circular beam and you want a circular beam. There are a lot more, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of richness to what you can get out of this thing. If you're really trying to get into the 99% plus category, uh, you can make customized sensors to measure exactly what the mismatch was. And of course, there's, there's a whole now maybe almost lost art of these uh, details of whether you use things like this biconvex or whether you use this uh, plano convex and then of course yeah, biconcave. How big should the beam be here so you minimize these the third order terms in the Snell's law and so on. But, uh, So that's, that's about mode matching. Um, then uh, without deriving, I just wanted to say uh, something about uh, what, what Ollie was showing there and about high, higher order modes because we've been talking about it over and over again. Um, in addition to the uh, Gaussian beam that I was talking about, which is this, this round thing, um, in a resonator, depending upon how aberrated the beam is or so on, you will often see these other shapes. and these, and they, and they look like this, hopefully. Um, whenever you have something like uh, uh, beam is too big or beam is too small, you can get these sort of modes. These, these are a little more rare to see. These are circularly symmetric, uh, circularly symmetric representation of this uh, Cartesian representation. We often see these types sort of modes in the cavity when we have the beam misaligned or clipped partially, when there's any, any sort of non-radially symmetric uh, perturbation going on. Um, I talked, I, I just mentioned without describing this, this thing here called the uh, GUI phase. Um, and the reason we were seeing the, the reason in this uh, diagnostic system that you see this splitting and you're able to uh, recognize these modes is because uh, each of these higher order modes has a different phase shift uh, because of this, this GUI phase shift. And this is this, uh, where is my GUI phase? Well, it's missing. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is the, yeah, this is the problem with my formula right now. Uh, okay, so there's, sorry, so there's some typo in my, in my formula. I thought it would have a, uh, this phase term in it. Anyway, uh, let's imagine, if you will, that I typed this correctly and the GUI phase term is in here. Uh, what, what we would see is that uh, each higher order mode has this term arctan of z over zr um, multiplied by the mode index. So there, would, there should be an extra term here where you would get a phase shift, which will be n plus n plus 1 times this GUI phase. And so each mode, depending upon the the mode index here will get pick up a, a little bit of a phase shift, and of course it depends on the details of cavity geometry or so. So when you set it up so that it's resonating for the fundamental mode, you'll get some shift, and each of for uh, almost all cavities, you'll have a slight phase shift on round trip phase shift for each higher order mode, and so it won't resonate at the same place. Then if you scan the laser frequency or uh, length of the cavity, you can get to the point where you have the constructive interference and build up for the next mode. And so that's, that's why uh, this diagnostic system works. So. Um. Uh, yeah, I, that, that is one way people say it. I, what I'd like to say is that uh, it has an extra uh, propagation phase that it picks up. And so the laser frequency setting or cavity length for which it resonates is slightly different. Yeah, it has a yeah, it has a different uh, it has a different uh, transverse k vector, so it picks up extra phase this one. Um, 
So, so I, I, I've described this, but I, I guess I should have started by saying what, why? What's the point of uh, uh, going into details about mode matching and Gaussian beams and so on? Um, it's it's a it's a bunch of subtle things, but uh, one you know primary purpose is we like to get all of the light that we generate. Um, the guys go to all this trouble to make hundreds of watt lasers, and then you would like to then uh, couple all of this into your system so you can use it for the gravitational wave detection. Yeah, that's one. Um, but then you know the true limits of our, our system come about because of uh, s scattering loss. We lose our power, and then. Uh, when we interfere the beams to try to make this uh, somewhat dark fringe, we also need to somehow analyze our system and find out what's going on. Um, and then there's a, I, I would say there's an extremely subtle point which is uh, a effect which goes by the name of uh, mode healing, which I think if, if people are interested, I'll, uh, I, I, I sort of feel like uh, describing this maybe tomorrow. But you know, so far we haven't described any of the uh, uh, sort of how power recycling or signal recycling works. We've described the simple Fabry Pro cavity and the Michelson interferometer, but um, after discussing with Peter today, I felt like, uh, yeah, there's a lot of ambiguity in the literature. Maybe it's worth describing. So, uh, what can we do? We can we can either swap out the lecture about uh, coding design or maybe reduce maybe in length some stuff about next generation detectors or controls yeah okay talk about recycling yeah okay Dead are right, so clearly that fan is with the cells that your Z has to be uh, yeah. small yeah. compared to yeah, yeah. It's, it's something like saying um, basically how, how much can the beam be diverging before this uh, modal expansion breaks down, and I think rule of thumb is something like several degrees, 10 degrees. I don't know. I've never, I've never actually tried it for extremely, uh, you know. I don't know exactly what breaks down, but this is what's what's listed in laser books. No, no, I didn't get the first question. No, no, I mean this whole thing would work only up to a particular amount of propagation, right? It's, no, it's not propagation. Z by Z R is. No. No, far uh, away then your divergence is just the angle versus distance. Yeah, yeah. But close by, your divergence is not just the beam angle. That's the way you have to look at it. Yeah. Apart from the source, your divergence is now a simple parameter of just measuring diameter and distance. You can calculate divergence. But that's not true when your ZR is comparable to Z. Yeah, I mean, in, in the far field, the you know, radius like curvature is just increasing. And it, it looks as if it's Very just good. a spherical. Maybe you're, you're asking something like, were there any, is there any, at the kilometer scale, does something happen that doesn't happen at the tabletop scale? It's, it's better at the kilometer scale, because at far off, you just look at it as a curve, uh, spherical wafer. As, as yeah, far as I understand from hearing from, from people who were around in the 90s that this, this was one of the big worries in the LIGO design that Somehow you would build a four kilometer cavity and it just doesn't behave as you calculate. But I think that's not true. It, it seems to, there's no, there's no new modal analysis which had to be developed. I could describe it. The correction is for the near future. The correction is for closer up. No, the other so yeah. you have a finite beam base. You have a finite beam base in the valley. Right? We can just demarcate. Ideally, when you look from afar off, it's like a point emitter which is emitting yeah. a spherical wave. So you're not using a spherical wave. Here. No, you're not. But <laughs> that's the approximation <laughs> runs to when your propagation distance is very far off. <coughs> Any other questions?
So come back. Well, I would have a, have a announcement. Yeah. Here. So I, I brought a little movie clip which shows basically how we put together that um, this high power oscillator in our lab. I'm going to show that in the coffee break, I think, this afternoon. So if you want to come around a little earlier, then I can comment on the scene. Yeah.